Thank you, Leon. Uh, thank you, everybody. So yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about some experiments and uh, some evaluation we are doing on ARM systems in general, and what are the motivations in you know some basic stuff that we found so far. Uh, the motivations by itself, and you know, being a technical product manager, so one of the things is try to catch up with the trends and catch up with uh, you know techn technology <coughs> evolution. And the idea is actually evaluate how Lustre 5 system would work on an ARM ser server since uh, we are seeing like a traction on the market getting uh, ARM servers driving uh, GPUs and driving you know, all the recent debuts of Cray and Atos and Fujitsu announcing uh, you know, the new architectures for the next years or so. So I think uh, we thought it would be a good idea to try to understand a little better how what is the state of the development in, in, in general terms for Lustre? So, of course, uh, the other goal is al always take a look and see if it it's, would be something uh, that we could prioritize eventually and, uh, you know, bring the market to another option. So, you know, keep up with the competition and, and everything. And, uh, and of course, uh, looking into the new ARM processors and new ARM uh, architecture in terms, so we see like a very good potential in terms of uh, memory throughput and, 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 and I.O. throughput that could be a uh, very reasonable and compelling uh, architecture for the future. So for those who, who doesn't know, ARM is basically a design uh, company, right? So they don't, they don't build the chipset, so they, they basically sell the design uh, for the other companies. And we adopted the Thunder X Kavian uh, chipset and a sh processor to do our study here. So basically, Kavian uh, has just announced a, the, the Thunder X2, which is going to be the new architecture f uh, and probably going to be available by the end of this year. But uh, the one we have, of course, is uh, the Thunder X, the first generation, which is a little bit uh, less uh, you know, performance-wise, it's a little bit lower. So this is just like, uh, try to remember a couple things. You know, this architecture is a little bit different from what we see on the Xeon. So it's less instruction level parallelism, uh, less cache. It's a little bit more homogeneous, kind of a Korean caching communication on a, on a chipset, a server on a chip kind of technology in a, <coughs> you know, multi-core uh, family. So the, the systems we have, it's basically dual socket. Uh, with uh, two 48 core CPUs. So basically we have a total of 96 cores running on, the, on each of those servers. As, an, as you can see, the cache line is much uh, smaller than usual, but there, there's some reasons for that, of course. Uh, we're not gonna talk here, but um, basically uh, a Kavian said that, you know, this is, would be probably optimal. So on the next release, uh, we probably gonna see a little bit more sophisticated, out of order kind of CPU uh, processor, and also larger caches. So just to give an idea where we are, so everything uh, today it's uh, you know late 2017, second quarter, uh, we get you know most of the development ecosystem ready. So the GCC and stuff like that is all native. It's not a, like a LLVM anymore. So it's not a cross compiler. Things so we are only compiling and doing everything in native in ARM V8 architecture, which helps us a little bit. And um, and we see for the next year uh, some traction on ISAD software supporting uh, you know real applications into ARM using all these uh, technologies as well. So the goals of these uh, you know in terms of Lustre. Uh, evaluation is very, it's basically understanding if it's a viable option, as I said before. Understand what would be the effort in terms of product development and pro product engineering to eventually prioritize a ARM server or a Lustre ARM kind of a, you know offering to the market. Understand the uh, general, generally speaking, how the I/O behaves on a, on a Lustre servers and also on a client side. And of course, whatever we do, we try to, to, to uh, contribute to the community, pushing patches and, and you know, just making available whatever we do in terms of luster and patching, etc. So just to give you an idea, uh, there's a lot of tests that I run and we run and we did a lot of stuff and we just summarized most of them. But uh, just to give you an idea of what we, what we had, we had a very modest system 
we don't have like a very scalable, only four ARM servers and we put another three uh, Dell equivalent kind of uh, uh, servers on the other side. And the reason, uh, we, I will explain after, but uh, basically we're trying to make sure that IO is not a bottleneck at all. So we put it like a, on our ARM servers, we attach a 7700, which is just a full flash storage array. So we can drive like 12 gigabytes a second. So we make sure that that wouldn't be at the bottleneck. And the other side, we did look at more like a lustre standard server, which is uh, uh, the ES, ES7K IB, which is probably okay to, in, in that configuration, to six, seven gigabytes a second. So just make sure that we are not being blocked by, by by the back end storage. So the way on how we thought is basically we we would evaluate <coughs> server side performance and also client side performance and do some comparison with a equivalent architecture to see you know how bad or how good it is. So this is just a test environment, just in my explanation what we have. I just mentioned uh, again just for the records. So what are we running? We, oh, by the way, on a, on a Luster server, on an ARM, uh, we ran Ubuntu, uh, just because the Red Hat, the latest Red Hat version is still not in uh, GA, it's still beta release, so Ubuntu seems to be the GA. So we have a little bit of better packaging system uh, running on that. But uh, on the x86 clients that we use for comparison reasons, we use CentOS 7.2 and, and um, on the embedded 7, on the 7K, Running Luster 7 x86, we did uh, with the uh, CentOS 7 3 as well. Well, this is where the first the the first thing we did is basically get a glimpse of how the CPU looks like. Right, not only for storage, but basically, you know, if people are adopting ARM to run a, a general HPC applications, what do we do? So uh, a lot of the spec int, spec FP rates, uh, you know, it's all published already, so it's easy to find. But uh, we were wondering what it would be the real uh, memory bandwidth, which is basically one of the bottlenecks we see on the Luster side, right? So when we, we evaluate the memory bandwidth and we normalize per number of cores, we can see here that the, R, the, the memory bandwidth per core is pretty low. So the average, the, the, the absolute uh, memory bandwidth looks okay, but at a per core, because you know you have like such a, uh, a large CPU, like 48 cores per socket, so the memory bandwidth is not great. However, as I said, this is the Thunder X1. So the projected performance for the Thunder X2, which is the new ship going out, coming up in, a, in, in the, later this year, project like 2.5x average performance uh, improvement. So that would bring the, you know, the, the per core uh, memory bandwidth more than what we have on the um, old generation, you know, the, the broader, broader <coughs> CPUs. So that gave, gave us some uh, hint on what we probably gonna see in the, you know, in the near future, in the next generation. But for now, we know more or less that we are running like five times less memory bandwidth comparing to the servers that I, the x86 servers that I use for testing. So this is just a sanity check to make sure that, you know, everything, RDMA network tests are running fine, and it's okay, you know, we see like eight gigabytes per second bi-directional bandwidth, 5.5 unidirectional bandwidth. So um, that's basically okay. So this is the MPI uh, memory bandwidth, uh, Ohio State University MPI tool set. As I said, 5.4 gigabytes a second unidirectional, eight point something, 8.4 by direction, it looks good. And uh, simple test to make sure that we can write on the raw devices, you know, just on a, on a block storage, you, we can write. So that array, that is a full flash array, so, you know, using uh, basically FIO with the two devices, we have like seven seven targets, but only two devices we can reach, like maybe five and a, five and a half gigabytes a second, and we maximize to almost seven gigabytes a second, which is, basically the IBSRP uh, throughput bottleneck that we have. So we connect uh, the ARM server into the um, uh, flash storage using IBSRP. So in that case, you know, this is just any check, so we are looking good at that time. So that's where start the first, uh, you know, evaluation in terms of performance. The very first thing we did, we basically run single client 
to try to understand and characterize performance of a single server uh, IOR. So as you see here, a single client, 96 uh, cores, we can do basically 3.5 gigabytes a second reads and 3.1, 3.2 gigabytes a second writes. So that looks just uh, okay, right? So considering uh, the memory bandwidth per core is much lower, uh, you know, we see something like five or six gigabytes a second on an x86 server, it, it looks like just fine, I mean, for me. And the other thing is, of course, as you can see on the number of threads, we have 32, and after 32 threads, you start seeing performance dr dropping drastically. So that we will talk a little bit further on. But that was like a, you know, some sort of a, you know, it's expected behavior. Right, so these, uh, you know, th limiting by 32 cores, there's an explanation for that. So then we start to say, okay, so now we know more or less what's going on with a single, with, with a single server, right? So what happens when we add uh, communication and we, we, we put like several clients? And by the way, this is all writing into the ARM server, Luster, Luster server. It's writing on a that flash storage running Luster server. And, and the idea here is actually try to understand not only the client, but, uh, but mostly what's going on on the server side. So for those who are not used to, so we have a patch uh, landed that we call fake I.O., which is basically what a fake I.O. is. We do all the I.O. transaction on Luster, but in the moment that Luster will write into the OSTs, we drop the writes. So basically there's no latency associated to writing into the disk or reading from, it basically drops the, uh, drops the I.O. At, at that point in time. That basically, for us, it's uh, a way to measure <coughs> if uh, the network throughput in the, in, on the LNET and on all the Luster layers are going well. So when we run fake I.O., basically we see writes being limited somehow for, at, at three, three, three dot. 3.2 gigabytes a second mostly. And read is going a little bit higher. And again, we see that uh, inflection point more or less in the same number of cores, like 24 cores per server, 30, 24 to 30, 32 cores per server. So then what we did, we just disabled fake I.O. and we run the real I.O., you know, writing into the disks. So we need got these things. So that basically, and we run some other tests as well. We run IO zone, we run like just other uh, more uh, standard kind of, a, you know, DDs and, RS and, and all kind of uh, tests on a file, but we saw pretty much the same behavior. So basically uh, we are seeing, you know, something limiting to 3.2, 3.2, Three, between two, three to 3.5 gigabytes a second reads and writes. So there was a question at that time if uh, what is blocking, if it's a server side or if it's a client side issue, right? So we knew that, you know, looking at the fake I.O., we could definitely do more than, than, than three point something. But on the writes, maybe there's something blocking, which is not even the disk side, uh, you know, maybe kind of uh, communications on, a, on the LNET side or, or the way on how we, you know, on the protocol, I, uh, we didn't know that. So, but again, the numbers start falling something like 24 to 32 cores. Well, we decide to do, okay, let's do end-to-end -end multiple clients and see how that happens, right? So we run four megabytes RPCs and 16 megabytes RPCs just to make sure that, you know, we are maximizing the most of uh, uh, the resources we have. And when you see uh, four megabytes RPCs, we see like, you know, again, reads going a little further uh, up to, you know, peak of four gigabytes a second and writes is still being limited at two gigabytes a second or so. And then we run 16 megabytes RPCs, we see reads getting a little better you know, a little closer to what we expected before when we ran uh, fake I.O., but the writes is still pretty much the same. Um, and, and again, after 64 threads in that case, because we're using multiple uh, servers, we start results getting really fuzzy. 
So results <coughs> going up and down and you know, non-reliable results, uh, I would say. So we started investigating that part uh, and playing with uh, things like LNet partitions and trying to uh, try to find a tuning point uh, where what do we do the best partition mechanism because we know that uh, you know that based on other KNL kind of experience we know that that makes difference uh, you know all, all, all the num effect and, and network latency related to the network partitions make uh, a little bit difference on on the performance overall. So I will talk a little bit after on the conclusions, but uh, we found you know the what it looks like to be the best tuning point. And after you know, 24, 32 cores per server, we start seeing that unpredictable behavior. Well, then you said, well, let's try to do the same kind of tests using x86 writing into the ARM server. If, uh, if the performance is really the same, the same kind of behavior, meaning you know, it, might be, it might be on the server side the issue, right? So it might be completely server problems. But if we do a little better, maybe uh, there's also a, a lot of client effects uh, affecting the performance behavior in general. And this is what we did. So again, writes is still about two gigabytes a second. That tells us basically, you know, if I use x86 clients that I know very well the behavior, you know, this is a no-brainer uh, kind of a, a performance study that we do. And so, well, but, it, but it's still pretty much similar, pretty much the same, right? Very similar behavior as the ARM servers. But on, on the reads, on the other point, I see a much better well behaved. So we see that we scale and we keep that, you know, close to five gigabytes a second, which is not what we can get in the most, but you know, for this stage of uh, uh, research and on, the, on these services, yeah, yeah we, can, we can say that this is just fine, right? So there's uh, that, that was the, the one first conclusion, that, which is basically there's something to investigate more on the right sides on how the ARM servers are actually writing uh, into the, you know, when, when you do a luster server. Because we knew that if you do like SG, SGD, uh, SGDP, uh, SGPDD, or if you do FIO, we can, we can bring these writes up to seven gigabytes a second easily. So a single server. So why Luster is doing only two, even with the clients that we know that is well behaved, right? well understood performance. So that's a part of the characterization that we, we, are, we are trying to find. So, and it, this is a, the exactly comparison that I mentioned. It's basically uh, ARM servers uh, reads and writes in comparison to the same number of servers, not the same number of cores, but the same number of servers on, on x86. And we see that uh, the reads on x86 behaves much better, and the writes is just like that. So that tells us basically that we need to investigate a little more what's going on on the right side on the OST level. And uh, in one point in time, uh, you know, looking into Jira, etc. So there's the there's a patch that has been developed for the KNL uh, servers, which is called Parallel IO PIO, that we didn't apply. And that patch basically, if you if you run into that problem, you look at your BRW stats and you see your your IO is being split up. And so well, maybe you know worth a check on the BRW stats on the server side, and you see that. And, and I zero before uh, the workload, and then I check in the after, and then we see that's pretty much well aligned. Meaning, I don't think we are we are hitting that the same exactly same problem, but uh, maybe. But we, we didn't test with the, the PIO we patch, which is one thing that uh, we missed here. But anyways, uh, and by the way, this is all Luster 210. We we use 210 uh, on servers and clients. Well, after that, we basically said, well, let's take a look on a, on a, uh, a client comparison, right? Because server, we know that if something is blocking on the rights, reads is probably an effect on the, on the client side at this point in time. So the x86 client writes and reads behave just as expected, as I mentioned, right? So it basically, uh, uh, the, the x86 writes, which is uh, this line here, it's pretty well uh, understood at this point in time. We couldn't get 
uh, the maximum bandwidth because we didn't have a, a lot of clients. But for for two clients to get like another three and a half gigabytes a second writes is it just seems right. Um, for the ARM servers, on, on writing into a, a x86 Luster server, which is the S7K, we see pretty much the same. So of course uh, we need more cores and we reach an inflection point a little <coughs> further on, but basically we can get the same right performance here, meaning, you know, it's probably, uh, that's probably okay. And no surprise, after 32, 24, 32 cores, we see that same variation that we, we knew that would happen at, this, at that point in time. So for reads, so we did the same in X86, we got it like 5.5 uh, gigabytes a second, and again, well behaved, well understood kind of a platform, no, no problems. In an ARM, we see also that a decline, a single client can actually reach almost the same. So may, maybe that, and, and again, when you get close to 24 cores, we see the inflection point and in the, in the performance getting pretty messy at that point in time. So uh, that, what that tells us is basically you know, for the single client performance is based, we believe that, uh, you know, ARM is, it, it, it's a little bit, little bit more uh, mature at this point in time. So we see those two points, uh, the, the, those are the, the, the peak throughputs that we can get reads and writes, and it seems just fine. When you do multiple client performance, again, X86 stable, <coughs> flat out, flats out on what we believe it would, would be. ARM server is a little bit, you know, a little bit different, but we still, still okay, I believe. And the reads as well, you know, just is, is not as great as the X86, but it just, just okay at that point in time. So again, the common thing is, we get on those 24, 32 cores an inflection point that more than that, it became really uh, unpredictable to, to, and unreliable to take it as a grain in, in any number we can get. So going to the conclusions, uh, what do we see comparing the server, uh, ARM-based uh, ARM, ARM versus uh, x86, right? Uh, actually, uh, a raw performance on, on ARM-based servers. So basically, we could we could get seven gigabytes a second. So doing uh, kind of a, you know parallel DDs and FIO, that's fine. The bottleneck we knew that it would be the SRP and the FDR, and you know communication-wise, uh, IB or MPI kind of communication is just fine as well. So memory bandwidth per core, as I said in, in the beginning, is much lower, but that's okay, right? So there's a, there's a lot of noise after an unpredictability on the server side. So we observe it, you know, that, that workload and we try to understand what happens. Basically, it's a lot, as we expected, it's a lot related to the NUMA domains. So we can change not only the LNET partitions, but we also can change the NUMA domains on the server side and we see basically, uh, you know, uh, Similar uh, behavior depends on how big and how large or, or how small is the NUMA domain. We try to do like, you know, maybe eight NUMA domains. We try to uh, turn it off CPU, so see, but basically it, it shows, I, I, I have in other documentation, but I don't have here all the, all the plots, but it shows that if you bring the NUMA domains a little smaller, you basically bring, bring the, the, that inflection point a little earlier. If you, if you go much larger, you, you know, it gets, you get seeing the noise after that in, in basically, uh, you know, there's no much of an effect. So um, we think that a, a PIO should help. I didn't test that, uh, but, but we think that, uh, you know, the, the behavior you're seeing with the multiple cores, is relatively slower cores trying to write, uh, serialize it, it's based, it might be one issue. So the best number of server is basically, you know, as I said, several times 24 to 32 cores. More than 32 cores is get like unpredictable and unreasonable results. And, uh, and in terms of the LNET partitions, we play from two to four to eight partitions and more. So four LNET partitions seems to be the best 
to the best point in the, in, in the plot, <coughs> in the graph. On the server performance, it really seems reasonable. As I said, writes needs improvement. So we, don't, we never found out what is blocking the writes to two and uh, maybe something between two and three gigabytes a second, knowing that we can do way, way more on a, on a back end. So that will probably require some profiling that we need to, we, we need to do you know, in the next, uh, on the next uh, stages of this uh, research. In the, in the read performance, since we've been maxed out to 5.5, and also deserves some level of research, but I guess I wouldn't prioritize that yet. Uh, I mean, you know, five and a half, five, five and a half gigabytes a second. Yeah, well, well, you know, comparing to the big fat uh, x86 <coughs> servers, is basically half, but it's not like one fifth or one thing. So here's just like a, you know, the example of the, uh, how we minimize the NUM effects, uh, changing the LNAT partition tables. Uh, as I said, initially set to eight partitions, so we start actually playing with the different numbers, try to find a better. And on a client side, we see the overall performance is quite equivalent to the old Xeons. And if you look at the, if you remember the very first slide, it's actually predictable, right? So we have like one fourth, one fifty of the uh, be memory bandwidth and performance in general. So, but uh, you know, four four times or f or five times more number of cores, that kind of matches. It says to, me, to us that basically, okay, we are in a, you know, in a ballpark uh, figures for 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 the uh, uh, client side. Uh, we, and we, no surprise, when we take out of the equation the Luster servers, we see a, a, a more well-behaved uh, reads and writes coming from the x86 ES7K uh, Luster backend. Uh, similar type of NUMA issues found on the client side and uh, on 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 then on, on the server side, but a much more complex to understand because when you get like multiple clients, so we don't know exactly if uh, we are seeing you know normal issues on the IO path for the for the communication, or if it's only you know uh, something different. So it's a it's a little bit more uh, intriguing on that sense. So we we didn't do, but uh, we couldn't try to play with the normal control to try to get you know uh, a better locality of the IO process and see if that affects. This is one of the to do things on the to-do list. So on the Luster side, it was pretty straightforward, surprisingly, you know. Uh, uh, we develop, a, we develop, uh, actually, we patch, we have two patches, that is, uh, Oleg has uh, reviewed already. I think it's, uh, it's already on, on the master branch at this point in time. And there's another patch that uh, Gu Zheng backported, uh, which is basically a Ubuntu patch. Uh, but other than that, Requirement is not really, uh, I mean, the, the build process is not really complex. It's pretty straightforward. And, you know, because the Ubuntu uh, server, it has some, you know, <coughs> incompatibilities with the libraries. So you build a library that eventually you try to app to get some other stuff, and then they co you complain that you patch the library and things like that. But that's probably work workable in, in the near future. So I would say that the process overall is easy, uh, you know, pretty straightforward. And what are we gonna do next? Basically, the, uh, we decide, so okay, so we have the first gleam to see what, what's going on. So we decide to uh, keep doing, we will keep uh, studying and researching the ARM service to see uh, what we can do to probably put a little bit more effort you know, on the development side. Uh, try to, one interesting thing that we didn't do because we didn't have like a, a, a good 40 gig fabric, so these servers, these ARM servers, they have, each one has two 40 gig uh, ports in a, in, 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 in a socket. And they have like an internal switch. So we are wondering if they using that internal switch for the 40 gig networks would make a, a little better behavior on the network side. So this is something that we need to understand and, and, and check. And also, there's some more advanced features like, you know, that we don't even touch, right? So the Luster code doesn't even know that it, that exists, which is, you know, like crypto uh, acceleration on a ship, you know, some sort of a RAID engine if you do, well, it's not our case, but you know, if you do uh, software RAID and things like that, I mean, it may uh, have some advantage, uh, but we don't know exactly what is the effort to get those uh, features done. 
So we also need to experiment this in a larger scale. So hopefully we, if you get more ARM servers, we can try to do a much better experimentation. Or, <coughs> excuse me, if we have some uh, customers willing to contribute and collaborate, we are more than happy to put an effort in you know, customers that has uh, uh, a decent size uh, cluster, uh, ARM-based cluster. And I guess the first thing that we should do is basically try to appear the parallel I.O. feature on the luster, you know, uh, get that patch and run with that patch. <coughs> and profile, uh, do a better profiling on the right side. And I think that's it. So basically, um, we got a little surprised to see uh, what, you know, how easy it is to, to get Luster running on an ARM server. The other thing that I, it, I, I know it's really modest, but at these servers during our week's testing, it never crashed you know, for unknown reasons. Uh, so we, we did some mistakes, but, uh, but other than that, it, it, it seems in, in, in a very limited environment, seems pretty uh, you know, well-behaved and stable. So that indicates to me, you know, that we should keep continue investigating on that, and then we will do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question, yeah. More of a note: the PIO patch is client only. There's no server stuff. There's yeah. no server component to that. Okay. Um, are you planning to like write a server component? I mean, you'd have to pick. It's there's a parallelization framework that's part of PIO, so you'd have to pick a server component to split among threads and then write that? I mean, so. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a conclusion that we will need first to profile the rights on the server side to try to understand what's exactly going on, right? So my guess is basically, um, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't even know if it's on a, on a cache line, the issues that we are seeing on the, on the server side, or if it's something more uh, uh, beyond that. But then we need to reconvene and eventually, yeah, I, I don't know how feasible would be to port the PIO into, into the server side. But, but you're right, so the, the tests we need to do is on, on, a, on a client side for now. Uh, why do you don't use uh, OBD air hard testing? Uh, with uh, UR, you have uh, so much overhead, like on client code, Clio, and, but with OBD, you can directly connect to the network protocol and uh, it will be eliminate any problems <coughs> on client side. Yeah, we, we run OBD filter as well, so we saw similar, similar uh, behavior. Uh, so the fake IO is basically, because we are trying to understand if there's something going from the CPU to the PCI lane, so the IB that is actually doing that. But we run actually OBD filter and the results were expected. It was similar, not as high as the raw, but a similar, you know, something like 20% you know, degradation on, on reads and writes on an OBD filter survey. Uh, follow up to that, did you, did you also do an MDS survey? No, this is, this is, this is something that we are missing. So we didn't have uh, time yet to reconfigure the system. I mean, on a, <coughs> the idea is uh, get something on the back end that is, is not the bottleneck, right? So we can make sure that, you know, whatever we have on the back end file system is just fine. And that system isn't optimal for, for metadata performance. So we, we need to re recreate and reformat the system in a, be in a better way. We are running RAID 6 <coughs> on, a, on, a, on a, uh, OSTs. So it would be better to rebuild the stripe using like six plus six, you know, RAID one, RAID 10, something like that, and, and, and just rerun, and, and we ran out of time. Fake I.O. Pardon? Your fake I.O. The fake I.O.? Yeah, and then you won't need your RAID. Okay. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, on, on a fake I.O., yeah, that's true. If you run with fake I.O., that's true, then we do Hello, um, do you have any data for power consumption of the different clients? Uh, that's a good question. We try to measure the power consumption. So basically, uh, what we saw on the specs is peak of 600 watts per server, which is, but we never instrumented on a, on a PDUs because our PDUs are kind of dumb PDUs. 
but yeah, that's the other that's the other good point. And it, 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 I think I guess it makes a lot of sense in two areas. One of the of course the client side where we're going to scale up, you know, for hundred thousand servers, but on the server side because we struggle to get you know the lesser service footprint when you do the embedded kind of solution, and that 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 is definitely something that we need to understand a little better. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you. We need to continue to do this.